Good morning, my friend. I hope you're doing well. It is Sunday morning, 23 July 2023, about 5.30 in the morning. Still really dark outside. I'm hoping to get a run in this morning. We had a crazy hailstorm last night. It was nuts for about 30 minutes. Swirling clouds and hail pounding the house and lots of branches and limbs down. After we get settled today, I'll be putting the grapple bucket on the tractor and picking up limbs and running the bush hog and doing all kinds of stuff to try to dig us out of this big storm that we had. I hope that you are going to have an opportunity to worship with your people and spend some time with the Lord today and have maybe some time off of work and just get your mind reset. You need that. We talked about it yesterday. You need that time to recreate and refresh yourself. And the Lord's Day is a good time to do that. Lisa had significant oral surgery procedure that was unplanned on Thursday, so she's really swollen and sore, and I've been taking care of her. Basically, if I want Lisa to have a day to recover, I have to either tie her down, drug her, or sit with her. <laughs> so yesterday we we mostly sat and and talked and chatted and watched the movie and just spent a little time. And it was nice to have a day where we didn't really have a lot going on. Since the book came out, since Hope is the First Dose released on Tuesday, it's been a swirl of interviews mixed in with my work and all kinds of things to support and promote the book launch on top of neurosurgery and patients and surgery and all that stuff. It's been a hectic week, so it was nice to have a, a little down day, and we didn't expect that trip over to Kearney, Nebraska on Thursday, but we got it done, and thanks to our friends Kristen and Al, who helped take care of Harvey and Lewis while I was taking care of Lisa that day, and, and the great folks over at Sand Hills Oral Surgery. Shout out to y'all if you're listening, and just a tremendous job that they did. Hey, today we're going to talk about one thing, and it's a neuroanatomy lesson. I know that doesn't sound very fun. I'm going to teach you about the anatomy of your seventh cranial nerve, your facial nerve. And I'm going to give you one story, and I talked about it in Hope is the First Dose. It's a really important lesson on the anatomy of our seventh cranial nerves. It also turns out to be an important lesson about hope and self-brain surgery because you can't change your life until you change your mind. The good news, my friend, even on Sunday, is that you can start today. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. That place is called self-brain surgery. You can learn it and it will help you become healthier, feel better, and be happier. And the good news is you can start today. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, so glad to have you listening today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa, my father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get it done if you like the show. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode and tell your friends about it. If you tell two or three friends this podcast was helpful to you, imagine how much good we can all do around the world together. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'm here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. All right, so I'm having a cup of coffee and just sitting and chatting with you this morning, friend. I'm going to be sending this out, this podcast, out as the Sunday newsletter. So for the last few weeks, I've been trying to give you more almost daily content to try to get you ready for the book launch and get you excited about hope. We had a great day yesterday of email and hearing from people all over the place, uh, from Ireland to Canada, the coast in the United States, people sending me photographs of themselves with the book. And I love it. It, it, Yesterday, I got two guys named Dave, a, a Dave who lives in Florida and a Dave who lives in Carlsbad, California, both sent me pictures of themselves reading the book on the beach. So we had Coast to Coast Hope yesterday, which is awesome. So love it. Send me pictures when you find the book in bookstores, when you're reading it out in nature at your home, picture of where you read, picture of where you do your Bible study. We love it. Lisa and I are so encouraged by the warm reception of the readers so far to the book. The first review is up on Amazon. There's a couple of reviews up on Goodreads, and they're strong so far. So if you like the book, one thing you can do to help promote this important idea of self-brain surgery and healing and hope to other people is to leave an honest review 
on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Goodreads or wherever you like to read or purchase books. And also buy a copy if you can, if you have the means, buy a copy to give to someone else. It's great when you loan books to people, but the the real way the book spreads is by purchasing copies and sharing them with other people or encouraging bookstores to carry it, libraries to carry it, church bookstores to carry it. That's how we really get the word out is to spread it to other people and ratings and reviews really help. So if you have completed the book, let us hear from you, but post a review. If you have time, that would be amazing. Also in about two weeks, we're going to do an online book club for the paid subscribers. So if you'll submit questions to me ahead of time, so I can parse through them, we don't want to have to bleep anybody out. I know you wouldn't do that, but we're going to basically do a book club and get on Zoom for half an hour or so with the paid subscribers who want to talk about the book and have a little book club. And I'll do that for you and your book club too. If you have a group of five to 10, I think it would be hard to do more than maybe 20 people. But if you have a group that have all purchased the book and you would like to do an online Zoom, reach out to me, Lee at DrLeeWarren.com. We'll be scheduling some of those throughout the month of August and probably September. We have a ton of book events coming up. The next one is in North Platte, Nebraska at Bible Supply Store. Shout out to the great folks over at Bible Supplies. But we're doing 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday next week with book signing. If you're in the central Nebraska area and you want to come over, shake our hands, uh, sign a book, take a picture, talk about it a little bit. We'd love to see you and hear from you at Bible Supply. So thank you guys for setting that up. There's another one in a a couple of weeks after that at the hospital, Great Plains Hospital Bookstore we're going to do. And I'll let you know about the details of that. Have incredible guests coming up on the podcast as as we pivot away from the book launch and get back into a self brain surgery attitude on the podcast here in the coming weeks. We have some unbelievable guests. One I've had on my radar for years. Literally, I started trying to hook up with her over two years ago on the podcast. Tish Harrison Warren uh, is the writer of a book called Prayer in the Night, which is one of the most important prayer books I've ever read. There's actually one of my chapter epigraphs in Hope is the First Dose is a quote from that book. She's the one that gave me this this thinking about how our ordinary suffering, our our extraordinary suffering is ordinary. She put some language around that, and I tied that in the book to a lesson I learned from Pastor John a long time ago that really helped clarify and change my thinking about some of the ways in which I was suffering and some of the ways in which you'll be suffering after you experience your massive thing. And Tish Harrison Warren, my friend, is coming to the podcast in October. We also have next month, I'm blown out of my mind that I was able to get this guest, Erwin Raphael McMahon. Manus, one of my very favorite writers, he wrote this incredible book called The Genius of Jesus, and his new book that's coming out in October is called Mind Shift, and it's all about neuroscience and how to change our thinking, and he did a great job. I'm reading an advanced copy of it now. It's another imprint of Penguin Random House is his publisher, and, and they reached out, and we were able to coordinate a day to get Erwin on the show unbelievable. We have K.J. Ramsey coming up. If you're a reader, K.J. Ramsey's written several books. Uh, The first one I ever read of hers, I think her first book was called This Too Shall Last, and it's about how to find faith and hope when you're dealing with chronic illness, these things that don't get better. And remember, we did an episode recently called Unsolvable Problems, and having a chronic illness, an autoimmune disease or something else, is something that never goes away. And so, KJ is going to be on the show in August in a couple of weeks. And we have the unbelievable, indomitable Karen Swallow Pryor coming back to the show to talk about her new book, The Evangelical Imagination, in a couple of weeks. And Andrea Herzog, who has written um, Uncurable Faith. It's just this am- amazing book about, again, about chronic illness and what to do when you're in that season when things aren't getting better, but you still need to find hope. So we have some incredible guests coming up to the show. I'm so happy. And finally, I will tell you, I don't have the date nailed down yet, but we have super confirmation, not just from her people, but from her herself, the amazing radio host and author of over 20 books, Susie Larson of Susie Larson Live is going to be on the show soon. I was on her show last week. We had an amazing conversation about hope. That'll be coming up soon, and I'll give you information where you can listen to that. But I just want to give you some encouragement. This podcast is getting on fire in the next couple of months. We have some unbelievable guests coming up to encourage you and just steal your resolve against the hard things that we face in this life and show you that hope really is the first dose, friend. So I've 
I've been doing some work, Lisa, and I've been doing some hard work to try to connect with people who will elevate your podcast game for you and help you find uh, some great things to think about and chew on from other writers and thinkers. And we're going to continue that Everyday Hope series. We're going to talk to some normal people who are living life just like you and me. And then we're also going to continue this series of amazing uh, writers and and accomplished people, just heroes of mine in different ways. And uh, I just can't believe I get to do this. This is not my job. I don't get paid to do this, but we do need some more paid subscribers, by the way. If you're interested in supporting the podcast, because we don't sell advertising here, the cost of hosting the podcast, the software I'm using to show you this video right now, Descript, the the website hosting, all that stuff, it adds up to a few thousand dollars a month. And this is a a ministry, but it's, it's expensive. And so if you want us to continue to add new features like transcripts and all these kinds of things that we've been doing, then consider becoming a paid subscriber. There are some things you get access to if you're a paid subscriber that you don't if you're a free subscriber. The free folks, of course, get my every week newsletter, all the posts during the week, the podcasts almost every day, and all that stuff. Paid subscribers get videos that nobody else gets, special episodes that nobody else gets. You're going to get the book club and all these kinds of things that are happening. And, and just Consider if this is a blessing to you and you can help us and you want to partner to help defray the cost of this, then consider becoming a paid subscriber. You can go to drleewarren.substack.com and edit your subscription or sign up for a paid subscription. That's it. That's the commercial for paid subscribers. But you guys are the reason we're able to bring all this technology online and do better things, have better microphones, and, and really up the game for the podcast. Has some incredible interviews coming up that I'll share with you soon that I've done for other people's programs, and we've got some even bigger ones and, and more nationwide ones coming up. Today in the newsletter, this podcast is going to be attached to the newsletter this week, but today in the newsletter, I'm also putting in links from some articles. Catherine Singer wrote an amazing blog last week that was inspired by Hope is the First Dose. John Swanson, my good friend that was on the podcast recently, Dr. John Swanson, wrote an incredible piece for his 300 Words a Day blog, and he looked at all of my books, and he found some elements I didn't even realize. I've been carrying through all these books and themes and ideas, and and he wrote this beautiful piece tying together a lot of the things I've been talking about for a long time, and I was really moved by it, and so I wanted to share that with you. Also, my friend Tommy Walker, my brother from another mother, (laughs) Tommy and Lisa and I just love Tommy and the work that they do, and you hear his music on every episode of the podcast, but he has been working working for two and a half years on an incredible song that was based on Isaiah 40, he brought an entire symphony orchestra into it. It's some of the most beautiful and moving music you'll ever hear. It's a world-class work of art. And I know a lot of people think that Christian artists, I'm, I'm talking to you, my friend Hank Yon, <laughs> a lot of people think that Christian artists aren't great musicians and they discount Christian music sometimes, but Tommy Walker is as good of a guitar player, as good of a songwriter, as good of an arranger, or better than anybody you will ever hear. And I've heard this from professional musicians. Tommy Walker is the real deal. And he wrote this piece for an entire orchestra, and it's symphony, and it's beautiful, and the lyrics are right out of Isaiah 40, and there's a choir, and it's just unbelievable and John Tay Moore the piano player did a beautiful job and Brian Taylor the, all of the guys from the Tommy Walker band are in it but also this incredible full symphony orchestra and it's just stunning I was weeping as I listened to it and Lisa and I I don't ever talk about this kind of stuff, but I was nerding out and excited about it. We donated a microphone. I had this incredible microphone that my friend, the professional recording engineer, Mark Hornsby, provided for me years ago. We bought it from him. Um, And I found that I wasn't using it. It's a mic that you can't use in a noisy environment like this. These mics that I use for the podcast are noise canceling. So if there's a train horn off in the distance and it doesn't reach a certain threshold, it won't get onto the recording. So I don't have to do quite as much work on the back end with these good mics. But that mic that I had from Mark is a Bach 195. It's a professional vocal mic. And it will pick up if a mouse in the next room twitches its nose hairs. It'll hear, you'll hear it on the show. And so I can't use that mic in a not soundproof environment. Tommy, we decided to 
to see if Tommy could use it. And I reached out to him and said, hey, we've got this mic that's just sitting in a box in my house and I'm not using it. And he said, holy smokes, that's a great mic. I'd love to use it. And it shows up on the video. So if you watch Tommy's video, when you see him sing, you'll see that Bach mic. And it just connects me and Lisa feel a little bit connected to this project. He is the Lord. And it's just amazing. So check it out. Okay. Long preamble to say this. Your seventh cranial nerve, your brain has 12 pairs of cranial nerves that come off the brainstem and provide the ability for you to do things like smelling, first cranial nerve, seeing, second cranial nerve. Cranial nerves three, four, and six are involved in moving your eyes around when you look around. Cranial nerve five is the sensation to most of your face, some of the ability that you have to chew, and some other things that the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal nerve, does. And uh, see, I covered one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. <laughs> cranial nerve seven is the one we're here to talk about today. Seven is the facial nerve. And cranial nerve seven does a number of things, but the most important thing to you right now is that it comes out of a little hole in front of your ear and it spreads out like that, like the five fingers of your hand into different parts of your face and gives you the ability to to perform facial expression. So everything, every time you smile or frown or wrinkle your brow or furl up your forehead, that's the seventh cranial nerve. Okay. It also does other things. It provides some of the taste sensation. It uh, tenses the, the tympanic membrane, the corded tympani part of that nerve it tenses the tympanic membrane and allows you to automatically filter how loud certain sounds get into your brain. But the most important thing we're here to talk about today is the part of the facial nerve that allows you to do this. Close your eyes if you're watching the video. I'm closing my eyes right now, and I can close them because the seventh cranial nerve acts like a little hook, and it will grab that lid and allow you to close the eye. The third cranial nerve opens the eye. Seventh cranial nerve shuts the eye, so open, close, like that. And I tell a story in Hope is the First Dose about a guy named Anthony Walker. We talked about him the other day, about him getting hammered. He got hit in the head with a hammer by the two dudes, the famous two dudes of trauma that you'll also read about in the book if you read Hope is the First Dose. But Anthony got hammered, and he injured his facial nerve, and he lost the movement on one side of his face. And over time, the problem with that is it it doesn't seem like a problem. It doesn't sound like a problem not to be able to close your eyes. But here's why it's a problem, okay? If you can't close your eye, you can't blink, then your eye will begin to dry out. And eventually, you'll start to get debris in your eye, and you'll start to develop scratching or abrasions on your corneas. And after enough time goes by, your cornea will become so clouded and scratched up and scarred that you won't be able to see anymore. So, interestingly, in order to see, you have to be able to close your eyes. And normally we think when you close your eye, you can't see. But when you close your eye, when you blink, you wipe away all that debris. It floats around. Your eye doesn't dry out. It's protective. The ability to close your eye protects you. I'm going to give you one little thought. We've already been talking for... How long has it been? We've been talking now about 15 minutes. Okay. And I'm not going to tie you up because today's Sunday and I don't want you to be listening to a podcast all day on Sunday. I want you to be studying your Bible or at church or spending time with your family. But just in case you're going to go to the gym and work out or have somewhere to drive today, I want you to hear this idea. When Anthony injured his facial nerve and he couldn't close his eye, he was in real danger of going blind. And I realized, I need need another sip of coffee to get into this heavy stuff, so have coffee with me. I realized as I was thinking about Anthony Walker, see that's one of those sounds that the noise-canceling mic will take most of out. Anyway, Anthony Walker was going to go blind if he didn't regain the ability to close his eye and look away from all the threats that were out there trying to blind him, trying to scar his cornea. And I realized after we experience trauma and tragedy and massive things, our brains become a really toxic environment of negative thinking and lies and bad feelings and harmful neurochemistry and all of that stuff. And what happens is your brain will trick you, the the devil, I think, will trick you into thinking that thing that happened is the only thing that matters in your entire life. You can turn it into an idol. You can become the biggest thing in your life. And what happens is, and I'm doing it right now, there's a picture of my son Mitch over there, and I can look at that, and some mornings I do it, to be honest with you. Some mornings I 
turn my eye and I see that picture and I go down this, I call it the staircase in the book, this mental staircase. I, I can just sit there and go down into this hole and think about Mitch and the fact that I lost him and think about all the million questions I have still 10 years later about that. And I think about how much it hurts. And I think about how sad I am and all that stuff. And I can go down in this big hole. And and the problem is, and, and that's not unhealthy, okay? It's normal to do that with your traumas and tragedies and massive things. It's normal to wonder why she left or wonder why he died or wonder why you got that diagnosis or wonder why you became disabled or why the pandemic closed your business that your family had, had run for a hundred years and, and why you went bankrupt. It, it's normal to, to ruminate sometimes on those things. But what happens is you've got to learn, as we talked about yesterday, you've got to learn how to biopsy that thinking and you've got to learn how to change your thought process and take control, take captive every thought, right? You you don't let feelings become facts. You don't let thoughts become things. You control that narrative, right? And the metaphor of the eye, though, I want you just to think about this. If you can't close your eye, it will become scarred like Anthony's cornea and you can lose vision and you can go blind, right? So if you can't learn that this idea that trauma becomes the only thing you can see and if you don't stop looking at it, you won't pretty soon be able to see anything else in your entire life. And that thing becomes so big, it burns into your retina and it will scar your cornea down. And before long, 30 years will go by and you'll realize that your entire life has become defined by that thing that you couldn't stop looking at. And friend, that's so incredibly harmful. And that's not what God wants. God gave you a facial nerve so you could blink when there was dust in your eye. So you could blink when somebody pokes you in the eye. So you could blink when your eyes become dry. So you could stop looking at certain things and start looking at other things. And here's what happens in relation to hope. In order to find hope when the massive thing is staring you in the face, you need to close your eyes. And you need to close your ears to the lies that trauma is telling you, and you need to listen for the still, small voice of God. As, as Tata says, the Lord is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is not a loud, abusive screamer. He whispers to us in our pain, and He comes alongside us when we're hurting. Psalm thirty-four, eighteen says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and if you quiet yourself and you calm yourself in that storm, friend, you'll be able to start hearing him. And if you close your eyes and stop looking at that massive thing, you'll start to see that God is showing you a path towards the light again. Anthony almost went blind because he couldn't close his eye. He couldn't stop looking all the time. If you really want to see, you have to stop looking all the time. And if you want to see past trauma and tragedy and other massive things, you have to be able to close your eyes and look elsewhere for hope because hope is the first dose and you have to find it by closing your eyes and closing your ears and listening for the still small voice and looking for the light and looking for the breadcrumbs on the path that other people have taken and finding that memory of the fact that this isn't the first hard thing you've been through and other people have been through hard things and yes your suffering is extraordinary but it's also ordinary in terms of everything that happens to everybody on this hard planet but there is also abundance because friend we're self brain surgeons we don't have a classical faith that depends on circumstances to find joy and happiness we have a quantum faith that says i can be in a john 16:33 hard world and i can be in a john 10:10 10, 10 abundant life at the same time I will be sad about losing my son, but I will not be a sad person because I learned through the grace of God, as Aeschylus said, wisdom comes to us by suffering. And in our sleep, against our will, comes wisdom by the awful grace of God, Aeschylus said. And I'm telling you, by the grace of God, and sometimes, yes, it was awful. It was soul surgery. It was self-brain surgery. It was painful. It left a mark. It hurt me. But finally, through that furnace of suffering, through the graduate school of human pain, I have learned to stop looking at the loss of my son all the time. I have learned not to let that become the only thing I could see. Because you go blind, friend. If you put that thing up in front of you, he did this, she did that, I got this, that happened, I lost this thing, that person didn't come back. Whatever it is, whatever your massive thing is, if you put that up as the only thing you can see, you're going to go blind from it. 
and you won't be able to see anything else. Anthony had surgery. He had his face reconnected to a new nerve. And over time, he regained the ability to close his eye and look away. And he also regained the ability to smile when he feels like it. And here's the most important part. Anthony's face has a little scar where he had the surgery to fix his nerve. And his smile is beautiful, but it doesn't look quite like his normal smile. There's still a little bit of evidence. If you look closely enough, there's evidence of his massive trauma that he suffered. But he can smile when he feels like it. And you can too, my friend. You've been hurt. You've been wounded. You may have not yet gone through the massive thing, but you will. And when you do, you're going to have a treatment plan. You're going to have that prehab of stuff like this and scripture and all these great things to think about and and build your hope on. You're going to have the self-brain surgery tools that I'm going to give you here every week, every day. And I'm going to write books about it. I'm going to give you seminars about it. And we're going to learn together how to be good self-brain surgeons. I'm working right now on a post that's called The Ten Commandments of Self-Brain Surgery. I'm going to give you that pretty soon. And I'm going to give you 10 rules to live by that you can use to build your brain up to become resilient against these major massive traumas. But the most important one I want you to learn today is how to close your eye and how to learn how to smile again when you feel like it. Because friend, trauma and tragedy and other massive things cannot be the only things that you can see. If you want to become healthier and feel better and be happier and learn how to live in this hard world abundantly, there's only one thing you got to do. You got to start today. Hey, thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the show so you automatically get every episode. And if you like the show, you'll love my weekly letter. Check out my writing at drleewarren.substack.com, drleewarren.substack.com. Get the free newsletter every week for my best prescriptions for becoming healthier, feeling better, and being happier through the power of faith and neuroscience smashing together via self-brain surgery, drleewarren.substack.com. And if you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at wleewarrenmd.com slash prayer. The theme music for the show is Make Us One by Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by the great folks over at tommywalkerministries.org. Check it out and consider supporting them, tommywalkerministries.org. Remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you, friend. Have a great day.